Mrs. Rosa, Rosa Parks. Parks. I have, I have learned, learned over, over the years, years that when, that when one's, one's mind, mind is made up, this diminishes fear. As Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University gathers today to celebrate the fullness, the richness of African American history and culture, we do so under the 2023 National Black History Month theme, Black Resistance. Good evening, I'm Valencia Matthews, and I have the privilege of serving as the Dean of the College of Social Sciences, Arts, and Humanities. And I am excited that you have joined us this afternoon, this evening, for a conversation with Soledad O'Brien about Mrs. Rosa Parks, which aligns beautifully with the Black History Month theme. Here to bring greetings on behalf of the FAMU student body is Student Government Association President and University Trustee, Mr. Zachary Bell. Good evening. Happy Black History Month. Dream like Martin Luther King Jr. Lead like Harriet Tubman. Fight like Malcolm X. Think like Marcus Garvey. Write like Maya Angelou. Build like Madam C.J. Walker. Speak like Frederick Douglass. Educate like W.E.B. Du Bois. Believe like Thurgood Marshall. And challenge like Rosa Parks. Greetings, I am Zachary Chandler Bell, a fourth year business administration scholar from Jacksonville, Florida. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this month's Black History Conversation. Now more than ever, it is important to know who we are as a people, to stand united in the face of adversity and challenge, and to preserve the history even when no one else will. Today, I encourage each of you to direct your ears and shift your focus toward learning more about who we are as a people. We are the walking descendants of kings and queens. Our culture is rich, our minds are strong, and our skin is black. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bell. I understand that we may have members of the Florida Legislator and City and County Commission members with us this evening. If you are here, would you please stand? And it is absolutely our pleasure to give them a round of applause to thank them for their public service. I also would like to take this moment to acknowledge the team and the sponsors who collaborated with the FAMU team, with the Rattler team, to make this event possible this evening. And that would be the League, uh, Jabari Paul, who is the chief political officer with the League, and just happens to be an alumnus of the political science program. I think I saw he's been working all, there's Jabari, working all afternoon. Thank you, Jabari. Also, the American Federation of Teachers, who is represented by Mr. Frederick Ingram, here on the front row. Thank you. And of course, the Soledad O'Brien Productions. I will say that we thank them because it has been really a joy to put this event together and they did it with such grace and so I want to, appreciate, want to say we here at FAMU appreciate you greatly. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the 12th President of Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University, Dr. Larry Robinson. Good evening, everyone. It is my pleasure to invite you to this wonderful event that we put in the category of great things happening at Florida A&M University every day. And certainly this program, this conversation, as you will soon discover, deserves to be in that category. So on the behalf of the students, faculty, staff, alumni, friends, and supporters, it is my honor to welcome award-winning journalist and powerhouse storyteller Soledad O'Brien to Tallahassee and back to Florida A&M University. 
Before I begin, I also want to acknowledge all of the students who are in attendance uh, this evening. Would you please wave your hand so everybody will know? I tell people repeatedly that we have some of the most socially conscious students in America. Their presence here tonight helps to acknowledge that. I also want to recognize our faculty and staff who are here. Would you please raise your hands? These are the ones who are training those young men and women for the world. And then, of course, our presidential ambassadors who have been helping you uh, as you came into the auditorium this evening. Thanks all of you for being here. I also have two other people I want to acknowledge. First is the former um, National Alumni Association uh, president, Mr. Tommy Mitchell. Tommy, thank you for joining us this evening. And my own Rosa Parks, Ms. Sharon Robinson, my wife of 38 years. Thank you. Tonight, we celebrate Black History Month with a conversation about a documentary entitled The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks, who's known as the mother of civil rights in this country. This documentary searches the story of an icon and what led her to dedicate her life to social justice. So thank you all for joining us tonight for this Black History Month convocation. But first, just a little bit about the person who's leading this conversation. So that O'Brien is not only an award-winning documentarian, journalist, speaker, author, and philanthropist, she is also the Chief Executive Officer of Soledad O'Brien Productions, a multi-platform media production company dedicated to telling empowering and authentic stories on a range of social issues. Additionally, she is a thought leader who has a national impact with her books, speeches, and presence on the, na the nation's op-ed pages, including the New York Times and the Huffington Post. She is very active on social media, particularly Twitter, where she has over 1.3 million followers. And I just happen to be one of those. She anchors and produces the Hearst Television Political Magazine program entitled Matter of Fact with Soledad O'Brien, which is distributed by Sony Pictures and also reports regularly for HBO's Real Sports with Brian Gumbel. She has anchored shows on CNN, MSNBC, and NBC, and hosted projects for Fox and A&E, in addition to con contributing to three major broadcast networks, NBC, CBS, and ABC. Ms. O'Brien has won three Emmy Awards for her coverage of the Haiti earthquake, the 2012 election, and a series called Kids and Race, she was also honored twice with the George Foster Peabody Award for her coverage of Hurricane Katrina and her reporting on the BP Gulf Coast oil spill. Her reporting on the Southeast Asian tsunami garnered CNN an Alfred I. DuPont Award. She is the author of two books, her critically acclaimed memoir, The Next Big Story, and Latino in America. In the wake of Hurricane Katrina, Ms. O'Brien and her husband Brad created the powerful, notice what I said, right? Powerful foundation to help young women get to and through college. The foundation supports hundreds of young women with mentoring programs, professional advice, and other services. In fact, this evening's conversation is a part of the programming of the Powerful Foundation. She is the mother of four children and a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Y'all can go ahead and let that go. go. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me with a rousing family rattler welcome for our very special guest this evening, Ms. Soledad O'Brien. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So, so the day. Hi. Hi. 
Welcome back. Thank you. Nice to be back. I'm saying welcome back because Soledad was the spring 2009 commencement speaker here at FAMU, so she really is back. <laughs> I like things when they come full circle. So uh, what we are here today to talk about tonight is certainly the rebellious life of Mrs. Rosa Parks. And so as we were looking at it, it is described as a feature documentary that delves deep into the civil rights icon Rosa Parks' historic work and her role in the Montgomery bus boycott. Through interviews with those who knew her, powerful archival footage, and her own words, the film tells the story of her extensive organizing, radical politics, and lifelong dedication to activism. she was considered a threat espousing radical views if they, if they could see her talk, talking about the republic of new africa or out there with the panthers then they, then they would understand the real world of parts but, but they might have been just a little frightened she has been an activist for over three decades for Ms. parks it was especially dangerous fighting on issues that are still very much at the forefront she, she never gave up she, she lit the torch to the, to the next generation. All right. So certainly we have to say that it is streaming on Peacock, and so if you have not had the opportunity to see it, I think the fact that you are here tonight says that you will take that opportunity and you will make sure that you take others along with you and tell them that it's showing because it is a wonderful piece. And so as we start, Soledad, uh, talk to us a little bit about what inspired you to produce this documentary. Sure. So I run, as my main job, uh, a production company. and. Um, Two women directors came to see me, and they said that they had this project that they were interested in. Uh, one was a woman named Yoruba Richin, and the other was a woman named Johanna Hamilton. And Johanna Hamilton uh, told me the story of how she used to read uh, tweets from uh, the woman who wrote the original book, The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks, which is an excellent, excellent book. Uh, her name is Jean Theo Harris. And she said, you know, every year, Jean Theo Harris on Rosa Parks' birthday would tweet a long, long thread about Rosa Parks. And she said, you know, I know a little bit about Rosa Parks. And she'd say, you know, first tweet, yeah, I knew that. Second tweet, knew that. Third tweet, didn't know that. By the fifth tweet, she's like, I had no idea. And so these two women came to us and said, and, and these tweets usually were like 25, 30 tweets long. And after the second or third, it was just stuff that nobody knew. And so she came to us, and the two of them came and said, we, we think this should be a documentary. And I was like, obviously, someone's done a documentary about Rosa Parks, right? Like, and they hadn't, which also surprised me, but kind of fit in with what I think we quickly realized was the theme, which is Rosa Parks is a woman whose history you think you know, but you don't. Mm -hmm. And Rosa Parks' entire legacy has been boiled down into this one moment on a bus. And most people don't know much about her beyond that. And so I was so surprised as we were doing this project um, to just learn so much about Rosa Parks, uh, ways in which she was an even more amazing hero than you thought, and ways in which, in some ways, the civil rights movement let her down. We could talk about that in a minute. And ways in which um, her, her participation in the, the Montgomery bus boycott, which I thought was basically, she sat on the bus, there was a boycott, it ended, everybody kind of moved on. She never worked again. She literally was never employed, and her husband as well, again. And so they moved on to Detroit because they were absolutely impoverished. And so I think there are all these really interesting angles. If you were to ask 
Rosa Parks, you know, who was the person she most admired mm -hmm. in the civil rights efforts? She would have said, while she loved Dr. King, mm -hmm. it was Malcolm X, X who she admired, right? So you're kind of like, wow, there's a lot of contradictions in this woman that I thought I kind of knew. Mm -hmm. And so we knew it would be a great topic. We just had to find a network uh, to buy it. Uh, we decided to partner with Peacock. Okay. And then um, I think a really brilliant choice by one of our producers was to uh, use the voice of the actor Lisa Gay Hamilton, mm -hmm. um, who, because of course, there's not a lot of video of Rosa Parks talking. Right. It was interesting as we heard her voice to begin to realize how how rarely really? we'd heard her. So you didn't you weren't you know you didn't really know her voice. And so uh, Lisa Gay was able to um, to read a lot of her letters. She wrote constantly, mm -hmm. and so she had a lot of letters that we could bring to life. Uh, through the voice of, of Lisa, basically playing the role, the voice of Rosa Parks, which we thought was a really amazing device to make sure that we were telling the story of Rosa Parks in her own words. Beautiful. So uh, as the executive director, you're listed as the executive director, so we have a lot of students out here and people's here, producer all the time, executive producer, I'm sorry. So as the executive producer, what was your role? So when you're the executive producer, your role is basically everything from making sure everybody's happy to making sure you hit deadlines on time to making sure people get paid to making sure you deliver to making sure the network's happy to making sure it runs. Uh, we have the directors who are out in the field doing a lot of the interviews, but we all sat around to talk about and partly because I'm a collaborative person, I really love people to talk about, like, so how do you see it? Mm -hmm. how, how should we do this, right? Here are the amazing things we have, some great archival video, and not enough of it for a full doc. Uh, you know, a lot of Rosa Parks contemporaries are no longer alive. Who should be telling the story? And, and that was kind of a group meeting of everybody getting together and saying, how do we overcome some of these um, challenges? And then, of course, probably the biggest thing is, how do you tell the story of Rosa Parks? Parks. Rosa mm -hmm. Parks life, Rosa Parks commented on 9-11. Like, she was alive weighing oh. in in the press mm -hmm. about 9-11. So the, the arc of her life was so long. Mm -hmm. And again, I think we just don't really understand or remember her impact on, on history outside of that one moment on the bus. So we knew it needed to be more than that. Mm -hmm. But then how do you tell her life story was really what we had to come up with. So when you're the executive producer, you're kind of responsible for just keeping people happy, everybody happy. Okay. Uh, good, easy thing to do always, absolutely. <laughs> so how long was the process for you from the time of conception to completion? Um, uh, probably, uh, probably a year and a half, two years, okay. because you, know, you first have meetings about the project, and then you have to... Um, create uh, decks and things to sell the project, right? So you go and meet with network executives and say, we have this project where we'd like to sell to you. And you bring it to a bunch of networks and then you figure out who's gonna be the best partner. And all of that takes a, a fair amount of time. Once they do that and they green light it, then it becomes, okay, what does the network think it is? What do we think it is? Lots and lots of meetings. And then you start the actual process of making the doc, which takes about eight months to a year. Okay, well, thank you. So you, you already, and I had another question about what led you to Rosa Parks and the documentary, and you answered that, but in uh, watching the film, I think we all learned, we're like you, we learned a lot about her that we did not know. She was 3D. In theater, we always talk about the fact that when you have characters, they have to be 3D. They cannot be one-dimensional. They need to be three-dimensional. And so that was the beautiful thing about watching this because I'm a crier. Of course, Dr. Robinson would never believe that. But <laughs> I did a lot of, uh, I think, you know, there were moments where you were just feeling it and it, it came out. So talk to me a little bit about the surprising things to you. Mm. And then I want, to sh I want to show a clip first, and then we'll talk a little bit about that. So I would say there were the things that surprised me the most were connections that I had never made. Okay. So a lot of us know about uh, Claudette Colvin, right? She's the young woman who actually was the first right. person who sat on the bus. I, I always thought that that story happened, and then later just sort of happenstance, Rosa Parks' story happened. Claudette was one of the students of Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks trained Claudette Colvin. I mean, like, that connection, I think, also underscored the idea that 
Um, the strategies behind these movements were incredible. The New York Times, when she died, said, described Mrs. Parks as the um, accidental matriarch. <laughs> and literally, there was not a thing accidental no. about Rosa Parks at all. You know, as if somehow, you know, she just kind of fell into this civil rights thing. And one day, she just, her feet hurt, and she just decided not to get, it, it, that's just not accurate. Mm -hmm. at all. And so I think kind of learning about all these connections, there's a great story in the doc about the students being sent home with notes from school saying there's going to be a boycott. No one told. All the students brought the notes back for there and said, do not put your kid on the bus. Mm -hmm. On Monday, we're going to have a boycott. And just the strategy to pull off something like this where no one knew about it the morning of the boycott was incredible. And so I always bristle. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> remarkable. So I always bristle when people like to frame it as she was tired or yes. she was accidental because she was not at all. And I think this doc really underscores just how much work she did decade after decade after decade to try to, try to further opportunities and literally rights for black people. So I, I think that um, to me, those connections were really um, surprising. And then the other thing that I think I wanted to explore in this doc was why do we love that idea of accidental? Like, why, why does it make people so comfortable when Rosa Parks is in this one little box, right? Like, she would say in interviews, um, like, I keep telling people, I, when I said I was tired, my, my feet didn't hurt any more than any other work day. I was tired of being pushed around. Like, obviously, that's a very different kind of tired. Mm -hmm. but, but the story people hear today is like, you know, she was end of a long day, she was just tired, tired. and she wasn't going to get up. And absolutely not. And so I always was curious, we wanted to explore in this project, like, why do we love that kind of storytelling? Why did that narrative continue on as opposed to the idea of all sorts of rumors snake through Montgomery's white community about Rosa Parks? that she's a NAACP plant, that she's a communist plant, she has a car, she's Mexican, that she's not even from Montgomery. We don't often want to talk about the reprisals. We don't want to talk about the consequences and how people make personal sacrifices in order to advance a broader movement. After the incident, I worked five weeks through the month of December and was discharged from my job after the first week in uh, January. The owner of the barbershop on the Air Force Base prohibits, you know, all discussion of Rosa Parks and all discussion of the bus boycott. And Raymond resigns in protest, thinking that, you know, if he can't defend his wife, that, you know, he's being silenced. Dr. King ends up getting the accolades. He is invited everywhere to speak, gets honorarium, makes money, survives. He, he's the hero. The civil rights groups would have her go out and speak at events and raise money, but it never occurred to anybody that they ought to find some way for them to be supported. I think that part of the way she was treated was because she was a woman, therefore taking advantage. And my is a small town. People had to know that she was no longer working. King, none of them offered her a job. Rosa was also a prideful woman and would not dare ask. And I don't think she was the kind of woman that would think she was owed. Able to share their, their story or they were just written out altogether. Okay, thank you. So it says African Americans and blacks can be a force to be reckoned with when we get together, do you agree? And how can we do that? Yeah, listen, I think, I think anybody's a force to be reckoned with when you do get together. And I think it's, um, it's not just African Americans and blacks, right? I think there are so many issues in which people actually have shared concerns. And the key in creating a strong groundswell is to say, who else needs to be here? I mean, in the doc, Rosa Parks works with an organization of white people who also wanted justice for black people. Uh, and, and I think that is a very interesting model. Like, who else needs to be part of your, your group? 
I mean, I think it's why people talk about allyship a lot now, which when I was in college, that wasn't a thing, it wasn't a word, no one you knew. Know. But, but right, it's about not just here are the people who are invested, but here are the people who are supporting the people who are invested. And by being allies, the whole thing can move forward, I think, um, better, faster, uh, and with more power. So yeah, I, I think it's not just African Americans and blacks. All right, so we have two other questions. Since much of Mrs. Park's history was erased or covered up, what was your first step in doing research for this documentary? We were absolutely blessed in having Jean Theo Harris's book because she spent seven years writing it. One of the very first things that we did was to get the rights to her book. And, uh, and in fact, a lot of um, running a production company, when you have something you want to work on, you have to get the rights. Uh, you, you, you figure out who, who are the people who have the story and I need to sign them to a deal. So you sign them to what's called a, sh a shopping deal or basically saying, we're gonna be in business together and over the next six months or a year, we're gonna work to try to sell this project to, to a network. And so we were lucky because Jean Theo Harris was very interested in having her book turned into a documentary. Joanna Hamilton had the idea of doing that, reading it off of Twitter. Yoruba Richin was really excited to help and so it all kind of came together very early on and because um, uh, the, the author was a professor of uh, civil rights history. She just had years and years of research, uh, and that helped us tremendously. Okay, thank you. So one more question after this one. How do we continue the work of Rosa Parks and other great leaders when political leaders are erasing our history from books and reinventing future scholars and, and preventing future scholars from learning our history? Yeah, we're at a crazy time. Um, listen, I live in Florida, so uh, I, um, I think what Jean Theo Harris, who really is the researcher on this project, talks about is, you know, what does the legacy of Rosa Parks ask you to do? And it's not, you know, to nicely clap when they're unveiling her statue, but at the same moment, voting rights are being stomped on by the Supreme Court, right? That's, that, that can't be it. So I, I think that you know, what Rosa Parks is asking us to do is what she did her whole entire life, which was to fight and to recognize when things are unjust and to keep going and to very much be disappointed at times. Mm -hmm. She wasn't Pollyanna-ish at all. She didn't, she didn't look at it with rose-colored glasses. She, she writes, I mean, if you read her writing, she writes so much about being disheartened and disappointed and struggling. It's really hard. But there's never a moment where she's like, yeah, I'm out, I'm not doing it. And I, I think that is what her legacy asks of us, like to do things, even if there's some cost to, to you. Thank you. So our School of Journalism and Graphic Communication. They are definitely in the house with uh, Dean Myra Lowe, and I'm sure this is a journalism question, and I kind of like the people, so I'm going to ask it. What advice would you give future journalists? <laughs> um, I had a chance to chat with the journalism students, and I told them a little of this, um, but I, I think it's actually good advice for uh, a lot of young people, even if they don't want to be journalists. Um, what I think has made me successful is that I'm a list maker, and I think when you're a list maker, you really can be very intentional and on track with the things that you want to achieve. Uh, so I would say, number one, start making lists. What are you doing today? What are you doing tomorrow? What are you doing next month? What are you doing next year? What do you need to get to in 2023? How about 2024? What, you know, like that's what I literally have lists every single place. Um, if you wanna be a journalist, you have to learn to write. You have to learn to write. And the only way to learn to write is to write. And the only way to get good feedback on your writing is to bring your writing to someone and say, could you look at this? Is it terrible or is it good? And then come back the next day with the corrections. It's the only way. Write and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite again, right? I told journalism students, you know, when I was starting out in journalism, we didn't have iPhones. So you, if you wanted to, to put together a reel to get a job, you had to befriend a photographer and then one day go out in the field and bring like three different jackets so you could, you know, do like your stand-ups with your different jackets on back to back to back. Um, and uh, now, if you have an iPhone, there is absolutely no reason that you can't be shooting yourself, reporting, telling stories. Like, if that's what you want to do, you can do that right now. 
Uh, and if you want to do podcasting, you can do that right now. You might only have six people watching it, your mom, your dad, your cousin, but, but you can be doing the work of it because so much of what we do is the, the practice of doing it. By the time you're actually asked to do it, you will have done it a hundred times, and so you'll be so much farther uh, along. And then I, I think the other thing is to really um, learn how to be resilient, right? Like you gotta get in there and get advice and bounce back and be willing to say, I've messed this up. How do I fix it? How do I get better? It's really hard. It's so, some days are just like not the day where you wanna hear what you did wrong. But you will go so much farther if you can find someone you say, I just, I don't understand what I did wrong. Or I do understand what I do wrong. How do I fix it? How do I do better the next time? And I think students like that really end up moving ahead because people around you can see those who want to invest in getting better. Um, sometimes you have people who really can't take feedback. And what happens is people stop giving them feedback, right? They're like, I get it. You really, you say you want feedback, but you don't want feedback. So I'm, I'm going to stop giving you feedback. But the people who can say, okay, I recognize that this can make me better. Can you help me? You know, you will go so much farther. And I think by being, you know, my mom used to say, my parents passed away a couple years ago, but mm. my mom used to say whenever there was like bad news, she'd say, take 24 hours. Boo-hoo, cry about it, sit in your bed, eat a higher gallon of Baskin Robbins, whatever. But on the 25th hour, get out of bed and start making a list. What's next? What are the pros? What are the cons? How do, I, you know, how do I think about the next step? Like, Take that 24 hours to feel sorry for yourself. But then, the next day, move forward. And I, I think that's really great advice. Wallow and then move on. Thank you. Thank you. So nice segue, you're talking about moving on. So what are you moving on to next? So oh, bad. interesting. So um, we actually have some really interesting projects. I'm trying to think about how I can describe them without giving away too much because we're in the process of working on them. So for example, did you know that the way the ambulance system, EMS, was set up was literally done because of um, how hard it was for black people to get to hospitals? in the 1970s, right? Late 60s, 1970s. And so we're meeting with this original group of, they were young black men who were medics in the military, who then started the first ambulance corps that would go on to become the groundwork for every single ambulance today, to the point where they were then cut out of the system. Beautiful. It's an amazing story. Uh, and it's amazing because a lot of these guys are, they're older, but they're alive and they've got a great history to share. So we're going to, we just did our, our we're doing our deal with them okay. to, uh, to tell that story. And I know that's going to be an amazing doc. Of, I mean, I, I, I had no idea that when somebody was sick, you called the police. And if somebody sent either you, the way they described it was like, either you were, you went into the, 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 the hearse, feet first or head first or feet first. And whichever one of the ways meant you weren't going to make it, so they could just drop you off at the undertaker. I am not kidding. And the other way meant you might make it. Oh, okay. <laughs> and it was just amazing. It's a really amazing story that, because, of course, it's American history, involves um, incredible scrappy success and also um, when EMS became something that was sort of around the country, that very group was cut out and not actually given the opportunity uh, to, um, to work in what they had actually not only done, but had, had pioneered. So it's a, it's a really great, great uh, story about this organization, so we're excited to tell that. Beautiful, and I think they're telling me that there's one more clip. I was I with was the with March on Washington, Washington in 1963. 1963. That was, that a, was great a great occasion. occasion. But, women but women were not allowed to play much of a role. role. The March, the March on Washington, Washington is, is one, one example, example of how black, black women, women are often, often marginalized, marginalized in the, in the civil, civil rights movement. movement. If, you look, if you look at those who, those who, spoke, who spoke, with the exception of Daisy Bates, Bates who, only who only spoke, spoke for a few, few minutes, minutes, the entire, the entire program, program was dominated, was dominated by, men. by men. There was a there was tribute, tribute to women, women in which A. Philip, Philip Randolph, Randolph, one of the organizers of the March, introduced some of the women who had participated in the struggle and I, and I was one, was one of, them. of them. They would they have, have her stand, stand up and wave, wave at people. people. 
There's Rosa Parks. You know, she sat down on the bus in Montgomery. Wave at him, Rosa Parks, Mrs. Parks. And she sat down. They never said anything beyond that. I was 15 when I went to the March on Washington. I stood there in awe of all of the people that had gathered. And I remember Lena Horne moving swiftly to the front of the stage, picked up a microphone and sung two syllables. And they lingered in the air. There was a blanket of silence. Lena, she was taking Rosa Parks around to European satellite stations and saying, this is the woman that started Montgomery. This is it. So when I saw her doing that, I joined her. We were determined to see that Rosa Parks was recognized. There's so much patriarchy built into the movement, like it's built into so many institutions. Women raise most of the money, do most of the organizing. But when you go back and check the record, those who've been labeled presidents or directors or the leaders, or the grand pooba, largely have been men, while the women have done the work. And Mother Park, so she was doing the work. Any final words about this documentary, The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks? I hope everyone gets a chance to watch it. I think she's an inspiring person, and I think that um, I went into the project thinking like, I did practically 10 years of black in America. I know a lot about Rosa Parks, and I was stunned at all I did not know. And so I think uh, anybody who watches it, as much as you think you might know, unless maybe you're one of the historians that was in our, our, our documentary, there's a lot that you don't know. And I think you'll enjoy this documentary. Thank you for having me. Appreciate Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So one of our sponsors, we would like for him to come up, Mr. Ingram, and sh share with us for a moment. Come sit with me. Good evening. Good evening. Oh, we can do better than that. We come from a call and response kind of uh, background. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Isn't this a wow moment? It is. Why well, everybody say wow with me? Wow. Say it backwards. <laughs> As a teacher in me. Listen, let me, let me say something here. I, I am reminded of Mahalia Jackson in the 63 March when Dr. King was doing his thing and saying and reading his words and there was a whisper behind all of the men who were standing in front of Mahalia. And she said, tell them about the dream, Martin. Tell them about the dream. And that's what you learn every day. You hear the spirit of the black women that are all around us. I'm reminded of Zora Neale Hurston, our homegirl. She said this, she said, you better find your voice or they will kill you and tell the story that you enjoy. I'm reminded about Maya Angelou. She reminded all of us that still we rise. That's who we are, the rebellious life of Rosa Parks. And I just want to say good evening on behalf of the 1.7 million members that we represent at the American Federation of Teachers, those people who teach and give their lives to students each and every day, inclusive of the great and historical Florida A&M University. Give yourself a big round of applause. Rosa might enjoy a poem, I should say Miss Parks might enjoy a poem that says, if you want a thing bad enough to fight for it, to work every day and night for it, to lose your time and peace and sleep for it, and if all that you dream and scheme is about it, and life seems useless and worthless without it, and if you gladly sweat for it and fret for it and plan for it and lose your terror of the opposition for it, and if you simply go after that thing that you want with all of your capacity, Strength and sagacity, faith, hope, and confidence, and stern pertinacity. If neither cold, poverty, famine, or go, sickness or pain or body and brain can keep you away from the thing that you want. And dogged and grin, you besiege and beset it. With the help of God, you can get it. Fam, you, HBCU students, 
You represent the very best of who we are. Dr. Robinson, Mrs. Robinson, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your guidance because you all are the shining light for us all. And so to all the students here, the question for you is what will you do? What will be your dash? How will you run this part of the race? Because this is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And Mrs. Parks gave us the baton. And Diane Nash gave us the baton. And Mahalia gave us the baton. And we keep passing it on to each and every one of you. What will you do? And when the history books are written, what will they say you did? And so the call to action is this. Protect our history. Learn it. Honor it. Cherish it. And don't let anyone from any level of power say that we don't matter and we don't exist. Don't let people uh, tell you and teach you that they brought slaves through the middle passages. No, no, no. They brought kings and queens, and they brought engineers and doctors and lawyers and parents. That's who they brought through the middle passage. And so I'll end by saying this, protect our classrooms, protect our institutions, protect our students, our educators, and protect our journalists. Protect the truth tellers. Our people will not be erased. Our stories will not be erased. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on until victory and your is name, won. Tell them your name and your, your name and your position. My name and my position? Uh -huh. I'm just an average guy trying to do some above average things. <laughs> my name is Patrick Ingram. I represent 1.7 million teachers around this country. I come from Miami, Florida. I'm an HBCU grad and I love all y'all. Thank y'all very much. And so, and so now we will sing the alma mater, only one verse and one in the chorus, and we will be led by Mr. Tommy Mitchell. This is not a solo, you suppose. It's not a solo. <laughs> and since I don't sing out loud, I won't be singing at all through my mic. Come <laughs> with your love and charity, we gather round our noble shrine. We lift our voice in praise to Thee and ask the blessings of Divine. Fam you, fam you, I love Thee. I'll fight and win whatever the battle be. The eyes and the green, Thy sun shall ever defend. Loyal to thy voice of love unto Fam you, fam you. Fam you, my love. Amen. Thank you all for coming. Stay right here, I'm going to get some pictures from there. <laughs>